standard model of particle physics is based on certain simple assumptions. They assume that there are two dimensionless points, one with fractional charge plus two thirds, another with fractional charge minus one third. Now for various reasons, they say that this fractional charge has three colors, red, blue, and green, while this fractional charge also has three colors, red, blue, and green. Next, those two fractional charges are held together by things called gluons. And if we have a red fractional charge and a blue fractional charge, the gluon has to be slash red blue. How many kinds of gluons will there be? There are nine kinds of gluons with three times three symmetry, which they call SU3. We have red, 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 blue, red, green, blue, red, blue, 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 green, and green, red, green, blue, green, green. So this is all you need to know about the standard model of particle physics. Now the big question becomes, is the standard model of particle physics correct? I would like to show you an alternative model which seems much more attractive to me. I call it the real model. Instead of three colors, we have three phases through time, like for a three-phase motor, just temporal phases. And we don't have fractional charges, but we have all integral charges. For example, the plus two-thirds would be a time average of zero, plus one, plus one. So two of the three charges are on, one's off. So we can have the first phase, plus one, plus one, zero, zero degrees. The second phase, zero, plus one, plus one, phase 120 degrees. The third one, plus one, zero, plus one, phase 240 degrees. Likewise, for, for an apparent fractional charge of minus one third, we'll have zero, minus one, zero, and that averages out to minus one third. We'll have three phases, minus one, zero, zero, zero degree phase, zero minus one, zero, 200, 120 degree phase, and zero, zero minus one, 240 degree phase. So this is a simple alternative to having fractional charges. The advantage is these charges are integral and don't need to be confined. The number of assumptions is greatly less if we consider this to be a time average charge rather than an intrinsic fractional charge. Let's teach everyone now a little more about the standard model of particle physics. They believe that during the Big Bang, all particles were massless like the photon, which is a light particle. Then after the Big Bang, a Higgs particle gave mass to all other particles except the photon. Well, that raises two big questions. First, how does the Higgs particle know how much mass to give to each of the other particles? The answer is nobody knows. Secondly, why doesn't the Higgs particle give mass to a photon. They don't have a clue. In addition to its cosmological weaknesses, the standard model of particle physics does not predict what we call holes. We can see small losses of mass during the weak or strong forces, which are similar to, to holes in semiconductors, holes of charge. These are fingerprints which tell us which kind of particle W or Z was involved in the strong or weak force. And I'll show you a little diagram. Here we have a quark moving forward through time has original mass. It oscillates to say a W or Z particle. The W or Z particle ejects a certain amount of mass energy 
Now naturally there has to be a hole there because there was lost mass energy and we reform a new quark moving through time with reduced mass. Now any good particle physics theory should be able to predict that yet the standard model cannot. Let's look next at what I call the real weak force. They have weak and strong. This is weak. We have a quark moving through time with integral charges 0, minus 1, and 0 has mass 614. Then it oscillates to a W minus particle of mass 157,000. It ejects an electron one direction. A neutrino is recoiling the other direction. Then it has a hole of lost mass and energy where the because we ejected two particles it's still moving through time but now it has charges plus one zero plus one and a mass of only six one two so we started with a mass of about six one four we went down to a mass of about six one two so that whole of lost mass is two point five three divided by six one four which is the mass of the quark and that's very closely equal to the time which the W minus particle spent in the quark, which is 614 divided by 157,294. Very simple to understand by this picture. They call this force weak because the heavy W minus particle is smaller than a proton, so the force doesn't go very far. Next, let's look at the real strong force for deuterium, which is the simplest example, just a neutron and proton sticking together. We have two quarks moving through time. One has charges minus one, zero, zero, and mass 614. The other one has charges plus one, zero, plus one, mass 614. Each of these two particles now oscillates to what's called a neutral Z particle, which is an analog of the W of mass 179,000. And when they do so, those two Z particles can decay very quickly to what are called quark-antiquark pairs. That's the same thing as a pion. Like a Q plus and a Q minus is the same thing as a neutral pion. And they know that neutral pions are involved in the strong nuclear force. Let's do some calculations now in the next second based on these masses. They call this force strong because it extends between a proton and several neutrons over some distance after the heavy Z particle decays into light quark-antiquark pairs or pions so they can travel some distance through space. Now we will show the calculations for a real strong force for deuterium, which is just a neutron and proton sticking together. We have two quarks this time moving forward through time, one with charge minus one, zero, zero, the other with plus one, zero, plus one. Both of them oscillate to Z-zero particles, form anti-quark quark pairs, which create pions for the strong force. Now, because they are emitting energy, each of the quarks afterwards has a hole of lost mass and energy in its zero component. And how big is that hole? It's actually the time which the Z-zero particle spent in the quark, which is quite obvious. These two boxes are the same size. So the hole of lost mass, 2.5, 2.17 divided by 614 by experiment is closely matching the time of the zero spent in the quark, which is 614 divided by 178,450. And this seems quite obvious. Just look at it. Now, they think that gluons are responsible for forming pions, but we know that's not true, because here you have these little quark-antiquark pairs which form pions, 
and there's a signature of the Z0 particle by the size of the hole and it can't possibly be gluons, it has to be two Z0s. To confirm the math so that everyone understands, the length through time of that hole in each quark matches closely the Z0 particle. Here we have one hole on one side, one hole on the other side. In the center we have where the Z0 particles were and they form quark-antiquark -quark pairs which make pions for the strong force. Each of them lasts for a certain time of a Z0 and there's a loss of mass of 2.17 in electric electron units in each hole. Very simple. So we can calculate the hole is 2.17 divided by 614, the mass of the quark, or 1 over 283 of the quark mass. The time of the Z0 particle in the quark was 614 divided by 178, 450, or 191, the time of a Z0 minus the time of a quark. So these two numbers are almost identical because the hole is a little bit bigger than the Z0 when it went in. Now we've shown how to calculate the masses of small holes left during the weaker strong forces, but let's talk about the total masses of a proton or neutron. This is very speculative, but I believe they both come from what's called a hypothetical neutral precursor, which is three quarks, or maybe they're neutrinos, all of zero charge, and they all have equivalent mass energies of 616.66. You can calculate that from a simple formula 9 times 1.50 times 137.036 which is the fine structure constant so the starting precursor would have mass 1849.99 the big problem is how to add electric charge to these fully neutral neutrinos or other precursors I believe we can do that by oscillations to Z0 particles and decay to quark anti-quark pairs let's look at one of these we'll start with spin a half for one of these quarks on both sides in time it will form a spin 1 Z0 with quark anti-quark pairs of charge two-thirds. The next one may be charge one-third, the next one may be charge two-thirds. So there will be a hole left in each quark of 616.66 over 178 450 which is the mass of a Z0, 1 over 289 the mass of a quark. So this is our starting point. So we've got these quark anti quark pairs how are we going to get how are we going to get electric charge from that next we may be able to create w plus or w minus particles from those quark anti quark pairs we have a z0 particle here formed by oscillation with quark anti quark pairs of charge plus two third and minus one third. Here we have another one with plus one third minus one third. These two quarks can form a W plus particle. These two quarks can form a W minus particle. After that we can get beta decay and lose mass by 2.53 like for a neutron or a proton. We have three of these all close to one another like a typical quark. Each W plus particle, for example, can emit a positron and neutrino like that with three equal probabilities for the three quarks. We'll see a total loss of mass of calculated 3 times 2.13 plus 2.53 for the beta decay of 8.92. Therefore, our next particle should have a mass of 1841.07, hypothetically.
This idea seems quite speculative. However, we know that quark-antiquark pairs can create neutral pions for the strong force. Here we have a Z0 particle. It gives out plus two-third, minus two-third quark-antiquark pairs. And they obviously can form a neutral pion for the strong force. Here we have another Z0, plus one-third, minus one-third. Again, it can form a neutral pion for the strong force. Now, if we have two nearby sets of quark-antiquark pairs, they might create W plus or W minus particles. And let me show you how that works. Here is our Z0, but it's close to another Z0 now. Not like in a particle accelerator when there's just one. We can combine those two charges, plus two-third, plus one-third, to make a W plus, or minus two-third, minus one-third, to make a W minus. It's a little speculative, but it might happen. Now we will summarize our overall scheme to create the total masses of a neutron or a proton. We'll start from a hypothetical neutral precursor of three quarks or possibly neutrinos with zero electric charge everywhere in a time average sense. It would have mass energy of 9 times 1.50 times 137.036 equals 1849.99. Next, after our scheme with the W plus and W minus particles, we will introduce three integral charges among those three quarks, one on each quark, zero, zero, minus one, zero, minus one, zero, minus one, zero, zero. This is similar to what's called a delta minus particle, but that has spin three half. For spin one half, we expect to see mass 1841.07. So in this step, we will lose 8.92 of mass going from the neutral precursor to our first intermediate. As a second step, we'll go through beta decay to a plus one, plus one, zero, zero, minus one, zero, minus one, zero, zero, which is just the neutral neutron, mass 1838.68. We lose 2.39 of mass. As a final step, we'll go down to plus one, plus one, zero, plus one, plus one, zero, minus one, zero, zero, which is just the proton plus. Mass 1836.15, we lose 2.53 of mass. So we'll start from this hypothetical neutral precursor. We'll use W plus or W minus particles to introduce a few fractional charges or time average neutral charges on each quark of minus one, that will go through two steps of beta decay, one to a neutron, the next to a proton. This scheme is, of course, very speculative, but it gives you an idea of what we might have to do to make the total masses of a neutron or a proton. Thank you very much. Enjoy watching this video. Just as a brief appendix, it's well known that neutrinos can bump electrons and make them change path by changing to a massive Z0 particle temporarily. And you'll see the electron change course. Thus, it's quite reasonable for a quark of zero charges, like we saw earlier, to form a Z0 particle temporarily, or a quark with charges, say, plus one, zero, plus one, form a Z0 temporarily during the part of the time when it has no electrical charge.